Hello, everyone. I'm back and I'm really tickled about my guest with me today. Let me tell you just a little bit about Ms. Naomi Yoda. Naomi is a member of a science team with Healthy Golf. Their role is defending the Gulf Coast from dirty energy and industry. Naomi works to uplift environmental justice and climate justice and advocates for wetlands and biodiversity protections. Part of their work is getting aerial pictures, literally riding on airplanes over disaster zone, zone, literally riding on airplanes over disaster zones like the recent Hurricane Ida to identify spills, leaks, and hold polluters accountable. Hello, Naomi, and welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure. I can't wait to start this conversation because you've worked with, in my opinion, the biggest of the big guys and beat them. Well, that's, that's the goal. Um, <laughs> there's, there's always more to do, uh, it turns out, um, on the Louisiana Gulf Coast and, and throughout the Gulf Coast. So we, we have a lot of work still to do. Um, and we've seen that even most recently, as you mentioned, in Hurricane Ida, um, with you know uh, many communities, especially some of our indigenous communities, um, being really, really decimated. Um, and so we we have a lot of work to do. I uh, I so understand the work is never truly done, and I totally understand what you mean. I too was always looking forward. I too never took a moment to just stop and take a breath and look back and go, we actually had a success or we actually had a win. And even the little wins are big when you're beating the big guys, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think that one of the things that's happening um, in, in coastal Louisiana is there has been um, a, a complete change in terms of public awareness around like land loss, for example. Um, most people are now aware that there is a coastal land loss issue uh, in Louisiana and um, it's not partisan. It's not, it's, it's become just a, a, a known topic and that that's a victory. Um, getting That's the public awareness is a victory and we have to, I agree with you that we need to, um, you know, recognize those things and, and celebrate them. Each one. So a month ago, um, I want to share with our um, listeners that just a month ago, Naomi's photography was the subject of a story. Um, before her plane, before their plane had barely lifted off, and you, you saw a spill at the Phillips 66 refinery. And then further south, near the mouth of the Mississippi River, Naomi, you found a nine mile long surface oil sheen. And then you found four more patches in Barataria Bay. That's a very large, beautiful bay in South Louisiana. So Naomi, just, just, I'd like to just get started here with, with the question. How does it feel seeing all of this disaster with your own eyes when you're up there in that airplane? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit overwhelming. Um, I felt um, afraid, uh, concerned, a little bit worried um, about the extent of what might be out there because if I'm seeing, you know, these these spills and these um, uh, events, there must be a lot more that I'm not seeing and that we aren't able to document completely. Um, so that makes me feel that makes me feel afraid. Um, at the same time, I also feel um, I felt, um, you know, empowered in a way that this is very important work. And, you know, in some cases, this will be my flight <laughs> and my photographs might be the way that that some of the rest of the world finds out about, um, you know, the result of of a strong storm and the plight of 
you know, our, our fishing communities and our indigenous communities, um, our African-American towns in South Louisiana that are affected year after year um, by climate change and storms. So this is a way for me to document and communicate with the a broader world um, just what we're going through here in Louisiana. So it, so it simultaneously, it must have been conflicting. So on the one hand, you feel apprehensive and anxious. On the other hand, it ha still had to be done. I mean, the work you were doing, uh, you, you could understand this wasn't about you. It was way bigger than you. It, it still needed to be done, no matter how it made you feel. Well, thank you so much for pushing past that. A, a lot of people would just rather close their eyes. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, I'd like to uh, mention to our listeners that after Hurricane Ida, which happened to uh, arrive in Louisiana on the, on the exact same day that Hurricane Katrina's surge arrived 16 years ago. But other, other than that, the, the, the storms are very different. Um, more than 2,300 spills have been reported uh, since August 29th, uh, 2021, and about 900 have yet to be investigated. That, that's my understanding. And I also understand that most of these spills are due to abandoned, rusted oil wells and pipelines that our regulators allow the oil companies to leave there. Do I have that right? That is that is correct. Um, we have thousands, tens of thousands of wells uh, and pipelines that are abandoned in in Louisiana, in coastal Louisiana, onshore, and also some offshore as well. Uh, and there are several procedures that the companies are supposed to go through. Uh, when they close a well um, and, and abandon it. They're supposed to shut it in properly. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases that works. And, and in some cases it only works for a while. Um, sometimes there can be a leak that, that arrives um, after the well has been uh, properly shut in. Um, and then there's also the case where the wells are not properly shut in. Uh, and or decommissioned and ultimately you know there's there's always that risk uh, that there will be um, you know a, a leak a break some kind of um, the pipes might rust for example you know there, this this equipment gets old and when it does is it is very susceptible to uh, storm surge and winds and underwater landslides um, uh, if it's offshore. So we see, go ahead. And I, I was just getting ready to say, it's not as if it's a surprise. Oh, a hurricane. Who would have thought of that? Who, who would have thought there no. might be a hurricane in the Gulf? It's not like any of these things happen were, were unforeseeable. It, it just makes my blood boil. And then isn't there another loophole that oil companies have tried to use where they claim, oh, we, we're not decommissioning that well because we're going to go back later and start getting more oil out of it at a future date, which they never do. Is, yes. Is that loophole so they is still um, available. Yes, that's still correct. Uh, so we... Um, there, there are several different types of closing off a well, like you said, and, and one of them, which happened a lot during COVID-19, because a lot of the wells were, were sort of, um, uh, laid to rest a little bit, um, because of, of lack of activity. Um, so a well can be kind of, um, just shut off with a valve for example, and with the intention of bringing that back online uh, at some point, or it can be um, shut in and then reopened. So a kind of more lengthy procedure. And in either case, um, in, in Louisiana, uh, we, do have, um, we do have operators that intend to reopen a well that don't. Uh, and that's, that's a very difficult situation for the environment because once that well has been basically abandoned, so no one is responsible for it anymore, there's also there's a time period um, that each company is responsible uh, for that well after it stopped producing. 
Uh, and so they're responsible for shutting it in properly and abandoning it properly. And after that time period, then the well becomes the state's responsibility um, and which translates into the taxpayer's responsibility. So suddenly now you and I are responsible for a company that didn't properly take care of its equipment and that didn't do its due diligence. It's, it's really a huge problem. And, and a problem that very, very few people about, I, I don't, I'm not a environmentalist and, but I even know a little bit about this, you know, thank goodness to the, the good work that uh, organizations like yours have been putting out there, you know, making us uh, aware of it. Cause it's up to us, the citizens to change the laws and, and to, it's up to us to say, no, we're not going to pay for the oil company's mess. Uh, so how many, about approximately, I, I know it changes about how many um, decommissioned wells are there in Louisiana? that have been pro properly, formally decommissioned by the oil companies? Ooh, um, I might like to get back to you on that no <laughs> because I don't have a good, no um, I don't have a good answer. And I keep thinking, so what I can tell you is I've that every like time 10, I see 000. the number, yeah, it's in the tens of thousands. Every time I see the number, I think, that is way more than I thought, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's very large. It's a lot more than you might think. It's um, crazy. And it, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And if you start to think about all of the wells offshore as well, it, it just becomes, um, you know, the entire shelf uh, of the Gulf of Mexico is, is really littered with, um, you know, aging equipment. And for whatever reason, Louisiana is like the, the garbage state and no one seems to care about all these wells off of Louisiana, but all of a sudden it's all this attention off, off the coast of California and there's lots of attention on an oil spill going on there. Um, and the reason why California doesn't have many oil spills and Louisiana gets, has so many is a whole story by itself, but you know, this is not just a Louisiana problem, right? Right. No, it's, it's not. Um, we do, if some of you have probably seen that map of um, oil and gas leases in the Gulf of Mexico, there are just dots all over the Northern Gulf um, of, of oil producing platforms, current and past. And so it, it, this, this problem of oil and gas infrastructure that then you know become something that that doesn't work anymore and that needs to be taken care of or that can cause more pollution um, those those wells are are literally all over the entire northern gulf especially off of louisiana and texas um, so that's also those areas are um, as as you said <laughs> directly in this hurricane zone uh, that we have an incredible number of hurricanes and that are increasing in both intensity and um, and frequency because of climate change. So it's it's especially um, you know difficult that the reason for those uh, for that increase and for climate change, is this very industry um, that's that's now in the way? It's I ironic, also wanted to add. It's very ironic. I also wanted to add that there are there's another issue of fugitive emissions from these wells that is happening all the time. So not even in a storm, we have uh, what we call fugitive emissions, which means um, there's a well that is continuing to produce. Uh, gas or oil pollution constantly um, and at low amounts. But once you start to add up all of those tens of thousands of wells, that can be a huge number. And so we don't have any handle on how much fugitive emissions there are. Um, and then we don't have any handle as well on what type of risk we're looking at for you know the next storm the next storm season well before we close today i'd like you to 
and I, I'll remind you, I would like for you to share with us anything you feel that our listeners could do to, to help with this problem. There's got to be something we can do, but we'll, uh, I, won't, I won't sign off before uh, asking you if you can um, help us with that. But, uh, but I do really want to, because this podcast is about beating the big guys and it's about how to take on the big guys in your community. And, and, and I, I'm, I, each episode is at the point is to give people either uh, advice or, or things not to worry about, you know, whatever it is. And so what I would like to start with now, before we get down to nuts and bolts is, is Naomi, can you share with us and our listeners a, a story where you or your organization or your community or your, or, can you share with us an example where either you or your organization uh, took on the big guys and, ha and had what you feel, what you could call a success? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, Several, several things come to mind. Um, I, I guess I would like to uh, raise up the story of um, the, I guess there's two facilities in St. James Parish in, uh, in central Louisiana. Um, those chemical facilities um, were slated to be um, developed right in the middle of, of uh, the 95% African-American um, historically black districts of St. James Parish. Um, and uh, through public opposition, uh, the Wanwa chemical plant, uh, which was to produce plastics, uh, was essentially revoked uh, its application to do that work um, and, and build this massive complex. Um, similarly, uh, the, the Formosa Plastics project is, is uh, still trying to move forward, um, but it has had several setbacks um, due to incredible community opposition. And that's, that's been a huge uh, change. It's been a, a, a big thing to see uh, so the that fight, there has been. Go ahead. The fight to stop the Renwa plant. Did I pronounce that right? It's Wanwa, W-A-N-H-U-A. W-A-N-H-U-A, mm -hmm. Renwa. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> now I remember reading about this. So mm -hmm. how long was that community effort to stop that plant? Over a course it was of a while. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, I want to say about five years at least, um, but it, it might have been, it might have been longer. There was sort of um, a number of different applications uh, that the company was making to try to push their proposal forward. And, um, but in the end that it was, it was um, revoked. Can you so, talk about that battle in the a case, little more? Can you can you tell us, you know, who, who, for example, who started it and who, and who led it? And, and I mean, everything starts, usually things start with a group, but if you could just tell, tell us a little bit more about that battle, we'd love to hear it. Sure, sure. Um, so several groups were involved in that. Um, and, and, but it's, it was also um, the culmination, I think, <laughs> was, uh, from folks that live in the district in St. James, uh, mm -hmm. that were, that are, you know, sick and tired of seeing, uh, large polluting industry, uh, just arrive in their backyard and, and have very little accountability for, uh, the impact of their pollution, uh, in, in the community. So, um, there were several residents uh, of St. James Parish that um, retained um, the, the services of the Tulane Environmental Law Clinic uh, and also uh, started communicating with Rise St. James and uh, a, a local community organizing group, a faith-based group, um, plus uh, Healthy Gulf, uh, Louisiana Bucket Brigade and others. Uh, and those groups um, also uh, uh, 
Louisiana Environmental Action Network was involved in that. And um, all of those groups involved um, attended meetings, uh, public meetings for the permits required um, for that plant to move forward. Ultimately, it appears that uh, the, the opposition was voiced and heard at the parish level. So there were several parish council meetings where multiple individuals testified um, in, in opposition to the plant. And that seems to have uh, changed, changed the outcome. So, you know, it really is a, a grassroots effort that can change some of these things. And that's something that, you know, again, we need to celebrate when that happens uh, because, you know, I think we often don't see that story in Louisiana. So um, if, if I could ask you, you, you're absolutely right that it was really the residents that were the culmination. Since even though these residents did have the support of LEAN, and healthy, healthy Gulf and and rise and rise the faith based organizations. You pointed out something so important, and I really want all of our listeners to to be aware of this. It was the residents. It was the people who live there. They were the ones that made the difference, and that's always the way it is. They are the ones with the power. And as helpless as as you may feel, as if if you're trying to start something in your community, you've got the power. And you've had it all along. It's almost like Dorothy <laughs> and the Wizard of Oz. You've had the power all along just because of this is your neighborhood or your community. Yeah, I think that this is something you've touched on something really important as well about um, just the, the idea of environmental justice. So environmental justice, uh, I'm using the kind of Dr. Bullard definition um, close to that of um, environmental justice communities are those which have um, a disproportionate amount of pollution um, or toxic waste in their community um, as compared to uh, the rest of the country or another um, demographic unit. And there are more people of color and more lower income people in those communities. So both of those things, um, a disproportionate effect uh, on uh, low income and people of color. And it's quite so, likely that, that the big guys know this, that, that this well, is no surprise. That it is no surprise because what, what, I, what I wanted to then connect is, is basically what you were pointing to that a lot of times, um, environmental justice communities, also sometimes fence line communities. So communities that people that live right at the edge of uh, a polluting um, oil and gas plant or petrochemical plant, those communities um, will be told, will be, there will be a, a community value that the industry is good, that the industry is doing great things for our community providing jobs, providing these, you know, um, opportunities and, and the, the pollution and the, you know, um, the polluting part and, you know, people getting sick is downplayed um, or, or even covered up in some cases. So this issue of people actually um, saying no <laughs> to that and, and trying to really investigate and hold up for themselves and for the rest of the world. This is what's happening to us, not the storyline that we're getting from, from these companies. It's a, it's a big thing. It makes, um, it makes all the difference, but it's really difficult. You know, I mean, we see this in Southwest Louisiana where, you know, people are, are concerned, people are more concerned right now with rebuilding after uh, Hurricane Laura and Delta than they are with whether there's a new petrochemical plant next to them, you know? And, and I think that that has to also be taken into account that, you know, the people can only do um, so much, you know? And so then it becomes um, also 
the rest of us, um, even national groups, it becomes our responsibility to intervene as well on people's behalf when they want that. Very well said. And I also, there was something else you mentioned that I, I want our listeners to be aware of, and that is the value of of faith-based organizations and how much they can contribute. So in my book, Words Whispered in Water, I talk about how I, 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 one of the most powerful people I could probably have with me when, when I was at the state legislature was, was a group of Catholic nuns. And they, when they walk in to that, to that dome and when they, when they walk up to a representative or a state senator, I said, the, the, I don't think it's a Louisiana thing. I said, they command an attention that, that is otherworldly. And, and, and one of the most powerful things that you can have working for you is faith-based organizations, which um, at the great General Russell Honore used to say to me, Ms. Rosenthal, we need more nuns. I would say, yes, General, I'm on it. Um, <laughs> so don't, so, uh, you know, don't hesitate to, to uh, consider working with faith-based organizations uh, in, in your goals. And that's something that um, I, I learned on the job. It's not something that anyone, that's one of the things I wish somebody told me when I first started out. Yeah, I think you're also raising something else that's, um, that's really important as well, that we're having a crisis of faith uh, in this country and that, that our religious and spiritual leaders are also community leaders, you know, and that we, we do need to have, um, you know, a connection to what is, what is our greater purpose here, you know? Um, and I think that spiritual and faith-based groups uh, are, are doing that explicitly, but we can also, you know, we can do that without, um, being, you know, using the church as, as a vehicle necessarily, we can also acknowledge that, uh, environmental justice is a spiritual issue, um, and, and use that in my daily practice of, you know, what am I going to do today? <laughs> what is my job today? Very, very well said, Naomi. I'm really glad you said that. Uh, if, if it's all right with you, could we move on to an ongoing um, uh, project, the Formosa project? Sure. Did you want me to talk about our recent victories or we have, uh, that was the other example I wanted to bring okay, up, uh, let's, actually. Let's do it. I, so I, that's, why, <laughs> that's why I forgot. Yes, there was a big victory recently. Uh, mm -hmm. So yes, you, if you could talk about that victory, but also um, uh, shine a light how it's not over. Yeah, so perhaps absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Formosa uh, Plastics Group uh, is is a similar project to the one that I talked about before, except bigger. Um, so it's it's a, a huge chemical complex that would be um, dropped into the middle of uh, the same uh, largely black district of St James Parish, and um, it is it would be uh, the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the state it would be the um it would uh change it would change a lot of pollution levels uh, i thought in i heard that parish formosa, and in the state i'm sorry to interrupt you but i thought i heard i thought i'd read that formosa would be the largest greenhouse emitter in the country i think that's true i think <laughs> that's true i knew it was the state but i, I had also heard yeah <laughs> that's right mm-hmm it's, it's, it's enormous. It's really, um, it's enormous. Those I also want to add those, there, fo those folks from St. James can't seem to get a break from St. James Parish here, right. yeah, but I'm sorry, you, you go on, you go on. Well, you we have, right. there's several areas. So St. James, um, and, and the river parishes, uh, from Baton Rouge down to Plaquemines Parish actually. And then also we have Southwest Louisiana, which has a lot of industry and, and it doesn't get as much attention, but has just as much um, impact, I think, in terms of pollution, uh, unchecked pollution from, from those plants. But uh, what I wanted to say is that um, uh, 
Formosa, um, they will be the largest, this enormous um, greenhouse gas emitter. Uh, they will also increase ethylene oxide uh, pollution in the parish, which is another uh, large issue that's, that's just getting some attention from the EPA now, uh, but that's been a huge issue for a while. Um, <laughs> and that we are hoping there will be some, some major revisions to the standards. Um, but the process of getting that, that plant, um, getting those proposals has been, um, it, it's been a long road already. So um, they've been applying for this permit um, for a while. <laughs> they have wetlands permits, they have air pollution and water pollution permits. Um, and all of those uh, have been being fought. <laughs> so we have an active lawsuit um, for the air permit um, for Formosa. And um, in, in the past couple of months, um, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, suspended their, the wetlands permit for uh, Formosa um, and just recently announced that Formosa would need to kind of go back to the drawing board and create an entirely new uh, environmental impact statement for the project, which was a, a departure, a large departure from what had been asked of them before. Uh, so, so this was a big change for the Army Corps of Engineers to say, you need to do a lot more. Um, and, and it was, it, it was almost unprecedented. I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't worked on any other projects where the, the, the wetlands permit from the Army Corps of Engineers was authorized and given and then taken back and said, um, no, <laughs> we need to, we need to have more, we need to have more from you. So it's, it's a huge change and it, it signals something else going on that the efforts to oppose this project um, have been getting attention. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't uh, ignore the fact that there has been just an incredible uh, groundswell of community organizing uh, to address this issue and to, to block this, um, this plant from coming in and, and polluting the parish. I know that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers holds its cards close to the vest. I don't think anyone knows that better than me, uh, having fought the Army Corps of Engineers for a decade. But in, in your mind, why do you, if it's speculation, they don't have to do it, but well, why do you think the Army Corps of Engineers made this groundbreaking, unprecedented uh, uh, action of revoking a a permit that had already been given. What do you think mm -hmm. was behind that? Yeah, there. So there had been a couple of decisions already, and from from different judges um, in the air permit case, for example, uh, saying saying some things that Formosa needed to do more, um, and and that didn't. Again, it didn't suspend their permits or or anything, but it was significant. Um, by just saying, you know, Formosa hasn't done enough uh, in, in terms of evaluating the impact that this will have, this um, chemical facility will have on the community and on the state. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't know <laughs> what the core is thinking, um, but I do know that that's... Um, there are several, you know, opinions and judicial opinions that could have played an, a, a part in that. So, you know, all of all of the efforts of people that have been raising the issue um, ha have played a part. I think. I mean, the um, New Orleans City Council was approached to um, to pass a resolution uh, to block uh, to pass a resolution opposing Formosa and that went through 
um, several other several surrounding parishes. Um, you know, that's that's a significant opinion as well. <laughs> um, of course, St. James Parish is, is the parish that has the authority to decide on it, but it does matter when uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge take a stand uh, on some of these issues. So um, I think that there's there, there are a number of could be answers to your question, <laughs> but I do think that um, at least we know that a lot of the work that's been done uh, to just expose some of the issues that Formosa would bring, that's been a huge, uh, a huge success. Well, thank you for bringing up the resolution. And I hope all of your listeners out there has been paying careful attention to that. It is just not that difficult to approach your city council uh, or your, your, or your, pet or your uh, county commission and request a resolution. A resolution, uh, anyone can go to Google and quickly look up how to write a resolution. You just uh, take a couple of sentences and throw in a bunch of whereases into it. Whereas, whereas, it, it's nothing to it. And, and it's really not that difficult to get a resolution and they actually carry a lot of weight. And so that's something that I'm really glad that my guest brought up is the power of the resolution. And, uh, and although Naomi, I probably shouldn't have asked you that question because no one knows better than me that the, how the Army Corps of Engineers hides, hides uh, behind its, um, its big USA emblem and, and, does, is not, and, and does not give information. It withholds information. And I know that better than anyone. So that was probably a trick question on my part. <laughs> However, I do, but now that they've done it once, now that the Army Corps of Engineers has actually revoked a, a permit once, well now, you know, going forward, you know, not only the people of Louisiana, but the whole country can go, it's not unprecedented. You Army Corps, you have, you have uh, revoked a permit before you can do it again. And so I, I, I believe going forward, that could be a quite powerful tool, uh, don't you? I do. I also think that there's something really important here about uh, we have we have several different environmental regulations that that I might interact with in my job. So we have the Clean Water Act and we have the Clean Air Act, and and there are regulations within those pieces of legislation that try to safeguard some of our our air and water. And uh, in this case. Um, this is, this was a wetlands permit. So, you know, it's, it's for, it's, that's a permit that comes under the regulations for the Clean Water Act. And, and my um, position <laughs> is that this isn't, this isn't only a water issue. This isn't only a wetlands issue. This is about environmental justice and bringing environmental justice into the conversation about wetlands, into the conversation about air quality, into the conversation about water quality. So instead of evaluating each of those pieces, wetlands, air, water separately, you know, we have to consider climate change. We have to consider environmental justice. We have to consider um, a host of environmental issues in each of those permits instead of, well, those are separate issues. We often, I often get um, a response to my technical comments to the agencies of um, that's not related. You know, whatever issue I've raised about environmental justice is not related to uh, a wetlands issue. And in fact, it is. Uh, and so, for me, one of the things that this signals, this decision by the Army Corps, is that there, there might be a change happening in some of the agencies about we do need to consider uh, environmental justice. We do need to consider uh, you know, the social and, and population community impacts of uh, these environmental regulations and, and policies. So I think that, that that's, a, a, that's a very exciting change if that's what's happening. 
uh, because that's exactly what we need if we're ever going to get environmental justice. I think what you said was so important. It is not just about wetlands. It's not just about uh, an abandoned oil well. It's not just about the birds, the oil birds. It is about justice. And thank you for the, but the smartest thing I've ever heard. Uh, and, and I certainly am feeling a little bit better today uh, hearing it from you that perhaps a, ch a change is coming in the mm -hmm. way um, DEQ and um, uh, these organizations that are supposed to be watching over us, maybe they are going to take these things into account. Is there um, any other words of encouragement? That was a big one. Any other words of encouragement you have today um, for our listeners who, who are all over, all over the nation? Well, um, I guess I just want to say that, um, you know, I think that we, we appreciate and need the continued support after Hurricane Ida. I know that um, a lot of people are still in, in severe distress. And, um, you know, I think that we've seen a lot of support already coming into the state and, and coming from neighbors within the state. Um, but I just wanted to kind of say, you know, thank you. And um, please, please continue. Um, we, it's going to be a long road to uh, recover from the hurricane. And I also just wanted to kind of say thank you to everyone for um, listening and being aware, becoming more aware in some cases of the pollution issues that are also kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a second storm in a way <laughs> where we have another um, disaster that was caused by this, um, this disaster. So uh, and, and that's, it's not the only one. We also have some social, very important social um, structures that need, you know, desperately need repairing uh, in order to move forward. Uh, but in terms of our environment, we have, we have a lot of work to do. So thank you for your attention and your continued interest in this topic. Absolutely. Thank you again, Naomi Yoda, for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Um, I wanted to add one more thing, actually. Uh, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> let's, let's, okay, producer, we're adding one more thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think you asked me earlier, what can people do? Um, and I did want to respond to that because um, there are lots of things that people can do. <laughs> um, but in particular, one of the things you can do is keep in touch with Healthy Gulf. Um, you can subscribe and become a member of Healthy Gulf and support our work. That will be hugely helpful in, in terms of enabling us to continue this work and report back to you on what is happening. Uh, you can join us at www.healthygulf.org. Um, you can also make donations to several of our partners and mutual aid organizations around the area. Um, in particular, another Gulf South is possible um, and Gulf Center uh, for Law and Policy uh, both of those would be would be great. Um, so we just appreciate everyone's support, and we will also send out um, action alerts and ways to be involved in in specific issues. Uh, so if you subscribe or follow us on social media, you can see some of those too. Thank you so much, Naomi Yoda with Healthy Gulf for joining me, and I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for having me. Okay, here, but hold on. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>